So hello, I'm David Grayson. I have the pleasure and the privilege of chairing the Institute of Business Ethics. If this is your first time at an IBE event, then you are particularly welcome. Just to say we are recording our webinar this afternoon and it will be available on our website and on YouTube um, within the next 24 hours or so. And we will be live tweeting during the course of today's conversation. For today's conversation, I am joined uh, by uh, Professor Sandra J. Uh, Sucher from the Harvard Business School. And Sandra has had a fascinating career because 20 years in business, in practice, with filings in retailing, and then with fidelity in retail investment. And then for the last 20 years, a professor in the Harvard Business School, where she has become a very well respected international researcher on the question of trust. What is it? How do we build it up? What happens in terms of potentially trust being lost? Can we rebuild trust if it is lost? How do we go about doing that? And in particular this afternoon, we're gonna be talking about Sandra's third book, um, which came out last year, called The Power of Trust, How Companies Build It, Lose It, Regain It. And Sandra wrote this book um, with her researcher, Shalene Gupta. And can I just say in parentheses, so nice that actually Shalene, as um, the, the researcher gets um, um, full billing um, on, the, on, on, on the cover and on, on the authorship, amongst many other involvements in the field of, of trust. Um, Sandra is on the advisory board for the Edelman Trust Institute. Of course, we had a session on this year's Edelman Trust Barometer just a few weeks ago. Um, she's involved with Deloitte on their Trust IQ, which is a proprietary tool to measure key elements of trust in major corporations and indeed in public sector organizations. And Sandra also works with PwC on their Trust Leadership Institute. She's written a number of very well-regarded Harvard Business School teaching cases, um, and um, she has been, amongst other extracurricular activities, the chairwoman of the Better Business Bureau in the United States. Her research was featured in the Wall Street Journal, in Bloomberg, in Quartz, in Business Insider, in CNBC, NPR, Marketplace, and in continental Europe, Latin America, and Japan. So we are in fantastic hands this afternoon um, with, um, with, with Sandra. Sandra's going to talk for about 20 minutes, and then I'm going to very gently probe a little bit and have a little bit of a conversation um, before we open it up. Now, just practically, if you have any IT issues, please use the chat function. But for questions, please use the Q&A. You can also vote um, for other people's questions that you particularly like. Um, so we make sure that, that we give them uh, priority. And um, do feel free to tweet yourself during the course of uh, this live webinar. Um, our um, kind of strap line um, is hashtag Business Ethics Matters, and we are, of course, at IBE UK as the Twitter handle. But Sandra, you are most welcome, and over to you. I think you're going to share some slides with us as part of your introduction. Yeah, so, uh, so David, thank you so much. Uh, it's always so weird to hear yourself talked about. Uh, you kind of feel like you've died and someone is sort of reading a, a eulogy, but I appreciate your very kind comments. I, I just wanna say how uh, excited I am to be here with people who are ethics and compliance practitioners. Uh, so I do the work that I do to help business. Uh, and so I've been in academia now for 20 years, but my main concern uh, is to generate research and insights that help people make business better. Uh, so I couldn't be happier to be with a group of you who do this for a living. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, give me a sec. 
And, uh, and so, you know, what I'm going to do is to talk about trust and, and the goals I have for this uh, presentation. Uh, the first is just to leave you <clears throat> with a better understanding of trust than you have right now. Uh, I want to illustrate some of what's uh, distinctive uh, about uh, leading and managing trust. Uh, and finally, I want to get into the practical realities of trust uh, and the way that it shows how it works in real business. Uh, to do that, you know, as business people, we want to start with, does this matter at all? Uh, so I smiled when David talked about ethics matters, business ethics matters. Uh, and so here's some data on why trust matters. Uh, so there's a study um, of 6,600 uh, employees at Holiday Inns in the United States uh, and in Canada. Uh, and what it found is that uh, trust in leaders, uh, it builds uh, actual profitability. So this is interesting. Uh, it's a correlation study. So and what it says is that when there's a one eighth of a point increase uh, in the trust in manager, uh, that the hotels where that is true, uh, they have an increase in profit of $250,000 a year. Now that's a lot of money uh, to be attributed to this kind of a factor. I don't know for those of you or all of you trying to make money, uh, that's huge on a per hotel basis. Uh, and what you can see is that, you know, a, a percentage of that is driven just by the behavioral integrity of the leader the perception that the matching of the words that the leader says and the actions of the organization are in alignment. Uh, so it drives profit. A, a second study uh, of the S&P 500 uh, looked at the entire population, the S&P 500, uh, and what it found was that about 10% uh, of the organizations were what they referred to as trust leaders. And that's uh, organizations where about literally virtually all of them uh, agreed with this statement that our leaders make decisions that are consistent and to, transparent. Uh, and so in those organizations, uh, they found that there was a correlation that those organizations were also two and a half times more likely to be high revenue. Uh, and, and so so this is interesting, right? You know, drive profit, drive revenue, which itself helps grow profit. Uh, and so it makes sense for us as business people to really start to think about what trust is and how it works. Uh, and then this also actually expands into countries. And I know we have people from around the world uh, on today's call. And so, uh, so there was a World Bank study of 29 market economies over a decade. Uh, and what they found uh, was that a 10% increase uh, in the trust in a population, the people who answered positively this question, generally speaking, would you say that most people can be trusted, uh, co corresponded to a 10%, a 0.8%, sorry, uh, increase uh, in the GDP of the, of the country. So when you think about that, that's saying that trust moves almost one full percent of GDP if there's trust within a country in how it is that the country operates and the way that people feel as citizens. Uh, so so tr trust matters uh, and uh, it's uh, that's useful to know, but it begs the question then of sort of, well, how do you understand this thing? So trust is a kind of a mushy concept. Sounds like a good idea, seems like a good idea. Uh, but then the question is, how, what is it? Uh, because it seems hard to define. And so I'm gonna do spend a little bit of time doing that. Uh, I'm going to spend some time helping to unpack trust and the, the, on the, what basis do people trust you and your organizations. Uh, and then the last thing I'm going to do anticipates a question that's already been put uh, to this organization uh, and to our presentation today, which is, can lost trust be recovered? And if so, how? So, so that's the, the game plan. I'm going to try to move through this with some dispatch because uh, I'm very, very interested in engaging with you. So uh, to think about what trust is, we're going to use the context of the pandemic. Uh, and the pandemic was a moment uh, in which many things were going on. Uh, so it caused a almost 5% shrink in the global economy. So that's the single largest drop in the global economy since the, the Great Depression of the 1930s. Uh, so this was huge. And what we know is that the effects of COVID would have been far worse if it weren't for the vaccines that were created to help us deal with this problem. Uh, and in order for that to happen, 
uh, we ended up needing to trust, you know, three institutions. We needed to trust governments that they would write decent policies that would help drive sort of who need, does what. Uh, we trusted researchers uh, that they would know how to create a vaccine uh, that would allow us to actually manage this. Uh, and then finally, we had to build trust in the companies who were implementing these policies. Uh, so when you think about that, that already starts to define some of the features of trust. So if you're a business, uh, you want people to trust you. Uh, but when you can tell from your own experience getting a COVID vaccination or the, that of the family members and friends, you may want people to trust you, but that isn't something that you can force. So only the person who makes the decision to trust uh, can actually do that. Uh, and so that's why trust is defined as a willingness uh, to be vulnerable to the actions and intentions of others. So as businesses, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get our customers, our employees, our investors uh, to be willing to be vulnerable uh, to our actions and intentions. A uh, second feature of trust uh, is that it's quite specific and context dependent. Uh, so what you can see here is that, you know, if this is a supply chain description of all the hands that a vaccine had to move through in order to be produced, uh, we had to trust the people who were creating the vaccine, trust the manufacturing process, which is very exacting in pharmaceuticals, trust the businesses where this was going to be uh, distributed, and then trust the actual point of contact with us. Now, as business people, this is kind of good news. Right, so trust is specific, it's context dependent. So it's like anything else that you manage in business. Uh, it's at a point in time. It's not a global thing that happens. Uh, the third feature of trust, and this I'm sure you have experienced in your own lives, is that trust is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, and, and so, you know, I don't know what the, the debate was like in each of the countries that you represent around how trust works in vaccines, but in the United States, it was highly contested. Uh, and so what you found is some people were quite comfortable with this, other people by no means, not so much. Uh, and so trust is in the eye of the beholder. There's no single standard uh, where you can say, well, everyone trusts for this reason. And so when you're managing trust, you're always managing a distribution of opinions within a population. And that's important to know up front. There's no single action you can take that everyone will agree with. You know that practically anyway. It's certainly true when it comes to trust. Uh, and finally, the last of these features of trust uh, is very organizational. And this is the notion that trust is built from the inside out. Uh, so, and this may correspond to your own view of what it's like to work inside your organizations. Uh, but what we know uh, from the pandemic is that when employees trusted their companies for how it is that they were managing their own health and safety, they then were able to do a much better job of taking care of their customers. Uh, and so that's why it's important as organizations for us to focus on trust, because it's built from the inside out. And so that's why your roles are so important to that. So if those are four features of trust for you to take away and think about uh, and think about applying, it begs the question then of sort of on what basis do people make this judgment, this decision to be vulnerable to you and your organizations? Uh, and here, uh, I'm going to talk about the elements of trust. I'm going to tell you uh, a case study of Uber, you know, the ride hailing company that uh, uh, almost all of us probably know, uh, and how it is that people make the decision to actually decide whether to trust. So the foundation of trust is confidence, and Uber gets huge marks for this. They invented ride hailing as an industry as we know it. Uh, and all the technology and human factor design that goes into creating a car that shows up, you're ready for it, uh, they take you someplace, no money changes hands, you get out. They created the viable model for that to happen. Uh, and so, but if trust were just based on competence, uh, that wouldn't explain why in 2017, uh, 500,000 people uh, actually deleted their Uber accounts. And that's because trust actually depends on other dimensions as well. Uh, and the first of these you can think of as motives, and I'm going to define motives here uh, as people's understanding of whose interests you take into account. Uh, so in 2013, uh, an Uber driver in San Francisco uh, hit, ran into a family of four. He killed a little six-year-old girl, injured the mother and brother, uh, and the family took Uber to court. And in court, 
Uber claimed uh, that the driver at the time really wasn't an Uber driver. Uh, and this was because he didn't have an Uber passenger in his car uh, and because he hadn't as yet accepted his next ride. So if you have to ask yourself whose interest is Uber taking care of at that point in time, it's obvious that it's certainly not the family, certainly not the driver, uh, and it's just principally the company itself. Uh, and don't get me wrong, I'm a business person, no company is at their best in a court of law. Nonetheless, this was a kind of signal that Uber was sending. When you say, whose interest do you prioritize? That the only name that's on that list is Uber. Uh, another dimension in this kind of ethical area is whether or not we think the company is fair and how it goes about actually doing business. Uh, and in this regard, Uber also gets attacked by many people. Uh, one example of what you would think of as fair means, meaning means how you go about doing business, uh, is that they charge wait fees for customers, uh, which means that if it takes you more than two minutes to get into your Uber, you will get charged money for the weight that the driver spent. Now you then have to step back and ask yourself, well, who does this affect? Uh, and this will largely and disproportionately affect people who are living with various kinds of disabilities, physical disabilities, cognitive disabilities. Uh, and when the news about this process and this policy came out, uh, there was a huge uproar uh, in 2016 and people thought, well, you know what? This is just unfair. And so that's another dimension on which people uh, actually evaluate whether or not they trust you. Uh, and the last dimension is, is impact. Uh, and when you think about impact, think of it as the sort of real on the ground, I can see it with my own eyes, I don't care what you say about it, uh, effect of your actions, your policies on my life. Uh, and in this regard, I'm going to tell you a story about a woman named Susan Fowler. So Susan Fowler wrote a blog post about her experience working at Uber. It was published in 2017. Uh, and in that story, Susan Fowler was a female reliability engineer. Uh, she came to Uber because she really liked the nature of the work. Uh, and when she left, she told, wrote about a number of ways in which the company was a very uncomfortable place for her to work as a woman. Uh, is banned sexual harassment, bullying, all those kinds of things featured largely in her experience. Uh, th that's actually not why I'm telling you this story. I'm telling you the story because uh, when Susan Fowler started at Uber, female reliability engineers were 25% of the engineers in the division she worked with. Uh, when she left, they were 3%. So Uber didn't set out to be a bad place for women to work, uh, but the effect of the actions, the culture, the leadership on the lives of women uh, meant that it was in fact a bad place to work. And so the story here is that impact matters and that unintended impacts matter. And in fact, when it comes to trust, quite often it's the unintended second, third order effects that actually have people quite upset. So if you just look at the, the dial that's here, you can see it's several things. You know, one is that people, the trust is a multi-dimensional judgment that people make. It's not just on a single, it's not global. Uh, and it is based on, in fact, people's judgment of companies in these four different areas. Uh, are they competent? What are, how are their motives? Whose interests they serve? Are they fair in what they go about doing? And what's the actual on the ground impact that they have on people's lives? Uh, and so guess what? Not being trusted matters. Uh, so here's what happened to Uber's market share. Uh, so I don't, if you've been to the United States, the, the domestic competitor for, uh, for Uber is a company called Lyft. Uh, and what happened was that Uber started out with more than 90% of the ride hailing market uh, and ends up with about two thirds. Uh, and who gets the other third? It's this company Lyft. Uh, and basically they gained literally, you know, almost 40% of their market uh, by the fact of just not being Uber. Uh, and so all the people that I know have two apps on their phone, they start with Lyft. And if Lyft can't get their job, if you can't get there soon enough, then they'll go to Uber. So look, you know, as business people, if I had a business that had 68% market share, I would be extremely excited about it. But if I knew that I started with 90% and 
I might not be quite so happy. And you could even say, well, nobody stays at 90% forever. Nonetheless, it's a very clear story that not being trusted actually matters. So, so here's the, the dimensions, the elements of trust for you to be thinking about uh, as you think about the ways in which people, the stakeholders that matter to you, uh, judge you and start to think about whether or not they want to trust you. Uh, and this becomes a, a way of a set of ideas for you to use uh, to say with a given stakeholder group, how do they think about my competence? How do they see my motives? How do they see the interests that they see me taking account of? Do they think I'm fair? Uh, and do they actually feel that I can be trusted based on the impact that our actions have on their lives? So, so that's the elements of trust, the basis on which people trust. Uh, the last question, which I'll just tell you a story about, uh, is this notion that can lost trust be recovered? Uh, so I started this particular line of research when I was in Japan, uh, studying a company called Recruit Holdings. I was there for to study some other uh, topics there. And when I was there, what I heard was that they had experienced a trust breach that was so great that the prime minister of Japan and his entire cabinet had to resign as a result of it. Uh, and so, but here I was at the time I was there, they were $14 billion in sales, global company in the sort of HR technology business. And so I got quite curious because everything I'd always been taught said that, you know what, trust once lost can never be regained. Uh, but here I was in a company that seemed to put lie to that. Uh, so I studied it and other companies to try to figure out how you recover lost trust. Uh, and so, you know, here's what actually happened. Uh, so the breach was a kind of a shares for favor scheme. Uh, recruit CEO at the time uh, show, sold shares of an unlisted subsidiary uh, to about 159 members of the political business uh, and media elite in Japan. Uh, and in exchange for that, uh, he received insider information, government seats on committees, uh, and some very beneficial business relationships. Uh, this got discovered by, by chance, uh, by some reporters. It was reported on every day in the news for about 10 months. Uh, and to this day, if you go to Japan and you ask people on the street, Tokyo, you know, recruit, you know, they will likely repeat back scandal. Uh, and that's how well known it is. So again, as I said before, they recovered. How did they do that? Uh, so there are three steps to recovering lost trust. Uh, first is you actually have to acknowledge uh, the harm that you've created and apologize for it. Uh, and so this is something that's very important for people to know that you know that you've done something wrong. So 30 years later, the story of the trust scandal is still on the company website. Uh, the second thing is you do have to take accountability uh, for what went wrong. In this case, society steps in. Uh, and so 44 people ended up resigning their position, 17 of them were arrested, uh, and the CEO goes to jail for insider trading. Uh, and then the third step is you do actually need to fix the problem uh, that either caused the breach in the first place or that resulted in reactions to it. Uh, so recruits employees actually suffered greatly as a result of this. Uh, their kids were being bullied at schools, uh, because it was no longer good to be associated with this company. So they began by involving them directly in the reclamation process. Uh, and the employees were given permission to farm out to all their customers and to describe what had happened in the company to take responsibility for managing the business going forward. A recruit also did many things to try to make uh, recruit what they refer to as like a good place to be from. Uh, they knew they couldn't guarantee lifetime employment. This was Japan. Uh, but what they could do is they gave them jobs based on their passions. Uh, it expected innovation from them and allowed them to grow their skills. Uh, and it even offers and continues to offer retirement bonuses after six and a half years uh, so that people who work there uh, actually are only the people who want to stay and other people get a boost out and new people come in. Uh, so the headline here is that lost trust can be recovered. Uh, it's a defined process, uh, and it's something that you can manage. Uh, and because things happen in business, it's really important to know and believe that. So just briefly, you know, three big ideas about trust. 
uh, this notion that trust is vulnerability. So you have power. Uh, and when anybody has power, people are vulnerable. Uh, and that's actually what's going on in the relationship of trust. Uh, second, very briefly, the trust is multidimensional. It's not just based on one judgment. And finally, the idea that lost trust can be recovered. So, so that's the kind of the trust primer. Uh, and let me stop sharing and move over to David. Sandra, thank you very much for that explanation. Um, we will have plenty of time for participants on the webinar to ask their questions. And I can see already we have some uh, in, and of course we had some submitted in advance of, of, of our session uh, today. But um, just to say, um, both the, the Uber story and the, the recruit um, holding story are featured prominently in, um, in, in, in your, your book, The Power of, of Trust, along with some fascinating stories about the BBC, the, um, the Carrie Gracie um, incident over um, un, 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 unfairness on, on, on um, pay between men and women at the BBC. There's a great um, discussion around um, Boeing and some of the the challenges um, that they're continuing to, to have, of course. Um, stories on Honeywell, on j and &J, on the Ritz-Carlton, where I think you also um, have some of that fascinating data about how improvements in terms of the, the satisfaction levels that guests of the Ritz-Carlton have mm -hmm. um, translates into bottom line um, improvement of performance in, in, in a very tangible way. And I, I love the story about um, your, your, your participation in some of the initial training programs for, for new recruits and, 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 and so on. And of course, you discuss um, one of the, the, the most um, egregious recent examples of, of loss of trust, um, Dieselgate, um, when some of the, the, the Volkswagen engineers um, falsified some of the software um, on on cars so that they passed various emissions tests and and and, and so on. I, I I wonder though, because we are the Institute of Business Ethics and we have people on the the webinar today and people who will watch on the the recording afterwards who are grappling with with these issues. But how do we? really bring ethics and compliance alive in our organizations? How do we really make sure that this is not something which is just tick box and so on? So how would you say your analysis, all of the research you've done around trust actually helps to give more oomph, more credibility to the work of, of ethics and, and compliance colleagues? Yes. So, uh, so that's a that's a really good question, uh, and I I think I would think about it this way. Part of so I've studied business ethics myself for a very long time. I teach a course called the Moral Leader, which teaches about ethics and uh, various moral philosophies and how you decide how to make ethical decisions. And one of the things that I found that I like about studying trust is that it's aspirational. So the difference between sort of managing compliance and managing trust is that trust is something I want. Yes. It's a positive attribute. Uh, it's something that I know can benefit the business. Uh, and so it becomes a different kind of a North Star uh, for people to use to think about the, the bigger picture of their work. Uh, so you know, if I frame my work as compliance, that is hugely important unto itself. Right, and quite honestly, all the stories I tell have some compliance aspect rooted in them, either for good or ill. So, so it's not like that's not central, uh, but if the compliance is framed as part of this bigger goal of being trusted by your investors, uh, trusted by your employees, trusted by your regulators, you know, then it becomes something that I think people have a funny, in a funny way, an easier time signing up for, uh, and it gives more credence uh, to the notion of how important compliance is, right? So that, you know, otherwise you kind of have to say, well, it's better to, you know, not violate laws and regulations and policies than given a choice than the other side. But this says, but if, when we do that, 
we are building trust. Uh, and we're not doing that, we're losing trust, right? With some stakeholder group who's counting on us. And quite often, honestly, it can be investors or regulators when you think about compliance as a function. Uh, and so, so that's where I think that beginning to think in trust terms allows people to frame their work in a way that, that is not just like, you know, here's the person showing up with all the things I've done wrong. That's a bad moment in my life. Uh, it, you know, and, and, and it's supposed to be, by the way, it, you know, I mean, that's the nature of the beast is we're trying to figure out what it is. It's not going well. Uh, but in that regard, if you treated this as kind of an enabling function that prevents risk, you know, that actually allows companies to get a handle on a, a front view of where it is that they may be vulnerable in order to be trusted, I think that it actually provides a, a different flag to, to battle under. I, I, and a much more exciting, and I think I would argue a more compelling raison d'etre for, for the ethics and, and, and compliance function. And if we think about it and think about your four kind of pillars of what constitutes and helps to build up trust, then when a board and a senior management team sets out a code of ethics or a statement of general business principles that it wants everyone in the organization to live by and to determine how they will behave in all their interactions with their different stakeholders, then that code of ethics and all that goes behind it in terms of what we say in the Institute all the time about how you really embed an ethical culture, that speaks absolutely directly your components um, about means and also about impact, I, I, I think as well, doesn't it? So this is really giving us more, more arguments, more right. rationale for why it makes sense for board senior management teams really to, to put the time and effort and set the tone from the top in terms of ethical behaviours, um, how we want people to, to behave around here. So, so yes. Now, before we, we, we go to, to the questions that are already um, coming in, so I, I, I better be very quick in terms of, 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 of this other question, but I was fascinated in, 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 in the book by, um, well, all the book, but by chapter seven. And chapter seven is all about um, um, the story of NCB capital in Saudi Arabia, and in particular, um, when a new, very young lady, um, Sarah al Sahemi, comes in as CEO and how she turns NCB capital, capital around. And I think you know, it would be great if you could just share for, for participants and, and viewers afterwards um, on the, the recording of the webinar, just share a little bit about this NCB capital story with Sarah. Yeah, so, uh, so this is a, a remarkably uh, wonderful story of a trust turnaround. So Sarah al uh, you know, as a woman in Saudi Arabia, uh, it's not easy uh, to actually make your way, and in particular, uh, always, and, and when she was doing this. And so one of the reasons why I studied this uh, I started out honestly just being interested because this was a trust turnaround. Her regulator had just given the largest fine to the bank that they had ever given to any company, any bank. Uh, the, the parent bank that owned the subsidiary was no longer allowing its products to be sold to their customers because they didn't think they performed well, didn't think they were good. Employees would basically sit in their office on their phones, kind of hoping for a better day. They were thoroughly dis, uh, de demoralized. Uh, and so there was kind of no place where you could look where Sarah al Suhemi didn't have a problem. Uh, and, uh, and so she had this kind of motto where she said, I didn't create this problem, but I do actually have to fix it. Uh, and so that became uh, her mantra, her way of understanding the nature of it. And it's a very interesting uh, way of thinking for those of us who do the kind of work that you're describing. Because quite often the people who need to fix the problems didn't create the problem, but they do in fact need to fix them. And so it's a marvelous story of someone who, as a leader, takes that approach. And, and you know, because the alternative story we also know as business people, which is to so thoroughly sort of trash the people who came before you 
uh, that it's not clear how much positive momentum you're getting out of what you're doing. So, so Sarah Alsuhemi comes in, she studies uh, accounting and business uh, at the advice of her father, who was a deputy counsel uh, and actually was the regulator responsible for the capital markets. Uh, she shows up at the first bank she works for. She's interested uh, in banking. Uh, and basically, they treat her as the spoiled rich daughter uh, of this guy. And they basically have no choice but to accept her because, look, it's the regulator's daughter. Uh, and so she then had to fight against these uh, attitudes that people had about who she was, what she knew. Uh, and she spent the next several years doing many things to build her credibility, starting with uh, taking on all kinds of courses. Uh, and then in the investment bank, she volunteered for any job that nobody else wanted to do. Risk reports, you know, anything that was sort of hard to do and looked unpleasant, she said, let me take a shot at it. So by the time she was done in her first bank, uh, she actually had touched every aspect of investment banking, uh, which is why she was then recruited to the second bank, which was a small uh, boutique investment firm uh, that was run with the uh, Sharia compliant laws. Uh, and so when Sarah gets there, she also has, she's going to be the only woman in this organization. Uh, and so she actually required written consent uh, from all of the men in the organization saying that they would directly work with her because that wasn't necessarily a norm that most people were comfortable with in Saudi Arabia at the time. And she knew she couldn't be effective if she didn't have that consent that they were gonna breach some of these uh, Islamic protocols around how it is that they engage with women. Uh, she becomes a very successful investment banker. Uh, and because of that, the parent bank, the owner of NCB, uh, NCB Capital comes to her and says, would you please be our CEO? Uh, and, and so, you know, by the time she shows up, she's kind of a known commodity uh, in the investment banking world, which is not that big in Saudi Arabia. It's much bigger now. Uh, and so, but nonetheless, she's 34 years old. She's female. Uh, and so she has to kind of work her way into uh, a process of working with people that allows them to trust her and trust the direction she's going in. So the case and the story in the book uh, basically describes how she goes about doing that. And it is a masterclass in gaining trust. Uh, so if anyone's interested either in the context uh, or in Sarah al suhaimi of whom I, you can tell I'm a huge fan, uh, as a business leader, uh, and as a woman who's overcome just remarkable constraints. Uh, it's a really great story. And it, and it feels like a great story also, incidentally, of moral leadership, which, of course, is one of your other uh, yeah. courses. And I hope I'm not breaking any confidences that before we, we started the webinar, you were describing how there were going to be a series of, of videos um, based on, on a series of interviews with her um to that that will be available for for teachers um around around the world in in due course now we better get on to these questions because we've got some really good questions um and i don't want to get into trouble with with our ibe team afterwards for not um getting through enough of the the questions so i'm going to start with with one from um genevieve who who asks so who is really responsible for how trusted an organization is. So wh wh where is the primary responsibility, I guess? So I, so for, I put it in two places. Uh, I actually think that from a governance standpoint, a company's board uh, is responsible for whether or not the company is trusted. Uh, and quite honestly, if the board is not, willing to back up management, uh, to care about different stakeholders, to prioritize things beyond making a profit for investors, uh, then it will be very difficult for the management that actually has to realize the plans that put that into place. So inside a corporation, of course, it's the CEO, right? It has to be the CEO because we're talking about something that affects all of these stakeholder relationships, multifunctional, uh, and it becomes something that the CEO can make a mark on uh, and help guide the direction of. But quite honestly, you know, the longer I've studied this and thought about it as a business person, if the board isn't there with you, then it's not actually going to be that effective. I couldn't agree with you more. And of course, it's totally consistent with what we're seeing in Japanese corporate governance in the 
Dutch, in our own here in the UK. I, I don't know what the, the latest thinking so much is in, in, in the US around responsibilities of the board, but certainly in the jurisdictions I've just mentioned, there is an expectation that uh, a board will be defining the desired culture of the organization that they are responsible for, and will then also be periodically checking to see whether the actual culture and the desired culture are aligned or whether there is a, a huge uh, mismatch. So I think it's absolutely consistent with that kind of thinking about, about board responsibilities. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, one from um, Yvonne about how we measure trust without a crisis. Uh, clearly, if you have a crisis like um, the, the Uber 2017, um, a time when, when half a million people remove their Uber apps and, and, and so on, then what happens afterwards, you can measure. And so you can see whether you are in the business of restoring trust or not. But absent a crisis, is, that, is it possible? So uh, there's a wonderful uh, company that I've studied in Kazakhstan, uh, and the company is called Caspi KZ, uh, and it is a uh, financial services platform. Uh, so long before other businesses were creating a super app, uh, in 2014, they created a super app that allows people to simultaneously uh, do banking, to do purchasing, uh, and to actually engage with businesses. Right, uh, and so uh, they have a very useful way of thinking about net promoter scores. Uh, and so, uh, so this is usually a, a kind of a, almost a throwaway at this point in terms of how the usefulness with which companies get out of it. Uh, Can I just in, in, interrupt just a moment, please? I suspect most people on, on the webinar will be familiar with, with uh, net promoter scores, but just maybe we have one or two people for whom it's a new concept. So. Perhaps just, just, just to yeah. elaborate, please. Yeah, yeah, thank you, David. Uh, so uh, a net promoter score so is a survey that's administered after a customer has had engagement with the company. Uh, it's usually an online survey. Uh, and it, customers were, are usually asked a series of questions, uh, including one of which is, would you recommend this business to somebody else? Uh, and so net promoter score became this notion that you want loyal customers uh, and the measure of loyalty actually is whether or not someone will tell someone else to do business with you as a customer. So there are usually three questions that get asked uh, in Kazakhstan and Caspi. Uh, they focused on just this question about would you recommend us to someone else and why? And instead of doing this uh, as an online survey, they actually make calls to 40,000 customers a month uh, because they are a bank and, and a, a platform. So they know who's doing business and who's in interactions with them. Uh, they ask this question, would you recommend us to someone else and why? They then tape and listen to the answers to these questions. Uh, and so they can start to organize them by which things do we need to fix that we're not currently fixing uh, which opportunities we may have, uh, and how are we actually being perceived? So, so this is a way to use a kind of a standard process, but to invest in it. So they have an entire you know, group that does this in the bank that's responsible for reporting monthly and where the bank senior leaders will sit and also talk about what it is that they're hearing from this. So when we say, you know, can you trust it on an ongoing basis? You know, that's one example. Uh, a, a second kind of standard issue example uh, is, is exit interviews, right? So this is a kind of a standard of how it is that a responsible business by, tries to figure out why it is that someone's leaving. Uh, and because of all the focus that all of us are putting on talent, uh, if you can start to really understand the reasons why people are leaving, you have a better shot at actually treating quite seriously the things that from a trust standpoint, you may, may not be doing well. Uh, so there are also climate surveys that companies routinely do. Uh, and so, so I, I think the general point I'm trying to make is, is to, for companies to start with the data gathering that they already do. Uh, and just to say, okay, of these things, which of these can we make a more robust uh, process for us to understand the places where we're either earning trust or losing trust in with whom? Fantastic. And of course, 
if a board and the senior management team stops for a little while to think about these questions and asks itself, okay, so recognizing where you started this conversation this afternoon, Sandra, about why trust matters, then what is already the kind of data that we are collecting that right. could help us absent a crisis like a diesel gate or whatever to be able to 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 measure how trusted uh, we are yes that, that that that's great thank you now one of the questions that we had um before today's session i think is also somewhat similar to to one that that ben raises uh, ben is an ethics manager um he says i'm an independent party within my organization However, I'm still an employee with a salary paid by the company, so some people struggle to trust my independence. Have you any advice in how to develop a trust in, in these circumstances? And the, the question we had from, from, from somebody before today's uh, event was saying, what are some of the starting points? What are some of the first action steps you would recommend, for instance, for somebody coming into post as an ethics and, and compliance head to help uh, them to, to understand what, what, what's involved in, in building trust. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, those uh, internal conflicts, you know, it's, it's, it's a cousin to the question that auditors get made, right? You know, where people say, well, if we're paying you to audit our books and records, you know, on what basis should we, can we actually trust that, you know, public accounting uh, and all of that. And, and so I, I think that from a practical sort of career management uh, standpoint, uh, there are some interpersonal aspects of being trusted that are important, right? So, so you know, the first of these is you actually saw data on this before, uh, and that's the the reliability by which your actions match your words, right? So that was that very first study, you know, uh, of the Holiday Inns. Uh, there's a study of NCAA basketball teams that found that the teams that won the most uh, had the highest trust in their coach, right? Uh, and the teams that, you know, <laughs> had very low trust actually do won the fewest number of games. Uh, and the reason they trusted the coach is that they they actually, and the dimensions are very similar to the ones that I laid out before. Uh, the questions people are going to ask is, are you competent? Meaning, are you good at this job? Can you do the things that we need you to do? Uh, they're going to ask and try to figure out what your motives are. And they're really going to try to figure out whose interests you're serving. Uh, and so that first question really was a question about motives. Right. Uh, you know, can I trust you if you're taking a salary from the company? Uh, and so you need to actually find ways to demonstrate your independence in ways that's quite direct and that people can observe and see. Uh, and usually, quite honestly, that uh, that relates to how willing you are to report bad news about an organization. Uh, and so, you know, I have a colleague who does work in audit firms, and he told me a story about a study that he did at one time. Uh, and in this audit firm, uh, he asked how many people have become partner uh, through reporting wrongdoing. And no one could find a single example of a partner who had done that. Uh, so honestly, if I'm coming into one of those jobs, I also want to try to understand if I become the person who shows my integrity, on my motives uh, by reporting what will happen to me. Uh, and is this something that actually is a feasible line of work for me to be involved with because of the way that the organization operates? Uh, so, so you have to be competent. Your motives need to be trusted. It's quite fair to ask whether or not I can actually expect to be rewarded for the kinds of things that you say you want me to do. Uh, people will then ask about you know, the means that you use and in the case of uh, compliance and ethics functions, that largely has to do with procedural fairness, right? So that's gonna be sort of the question of, do you treat everyone, every problem you find the same? Do you use the same standard when you look at these different organizations? Are you closer to some one division than another? Do they get preferential treatment? Uh, and so, so procedural fairness, you know, treating like as like, uh, is going to be important. And then the last thing is people are going to look at the impact. 
that you actually have in your role. Uh, so, so when you're getting started, uh, I guess my advice would be to understand the ways that you'll be evaluated over time. Uh, I would pay particular attention to the culture and climate I'm moving in uh, and really try to understand whether or not the brief that I have for my job, uh, which is to tell the truth about some unpleasant things, is actually going to be supported. Uh, and how can I find that out? I have to ask people. I have to ask what happened to people who did that the last time. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and then you at least have a, a beginning of understanding what's the nature of the organization that you've joined and the challenge that you face. In some places, it's like, you know what, that guy got rewarded. Other places, not so much. And actually, gosh, it sounds like some of those um, questions to be asking are probably ones that you should be asking in your job interviews rather than, 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 than after you, 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 you've taken the job as, as, as well. Um, and I have to say that um, that point about how many people in the audit firm made partner after speaking up is a great opportunity for me just to uh, remind everyone that on July the 19th, we have a masterclass for the Institute on speaking up and how you can build a successful speak up culture in an organisation as part of an organisation that really wants to be an ethical, responsible one and of course one is trying to build cult uh, build trust now question that, that that came in very early on that um i think we should um deal with is is from sally who asks um these kind of four dimensions so the competence the um the the, the motives and means and impact how how did those emerge the this is the result of your 20 years of, of, of research, I'm, I'm guessing, but, but. Yeah, so, um, I, so let me think that the, the non-tactical term I would use is it is a kind of a mashup, <laughs> meaning that, uh, that, so there's a, a, an entire academic discipline that studies trust in organizations. There's a separate discipline actually that studies trust in leaders and et cetera. Uh, and, in the literature there, you know, competence always shows up, right? Some notion of, of being ethical always shows up. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, so those two, I kind of, dis and then for my work on moral leadership, I'd learned to think more carefully about sort of how to take a notion like ethics and try to break it into something that's more pragmatic, right? Uh, and so that's when I started thinking about this notion about first, what are my motives and how do people understand that? Uh, and then what are my means? How do I go about doing the things that I do? Uh, and so, so I wanted to sort of take this notion of ethics and expand it. The thing that actually surprised me in the literature uh, is that there was surprisingly little emphasis on the actual real world impact of actions. Uh, and so this is probably more me as a practitioner, you know, saying, well, come on now, <laughs> you know, uh, are we Boeing? Has a plane fallen out of the sky? You, you know, uh, have we underreported something? Are we not paying our fair share of taxes? You know, what actually is going on here? Uh, and so to me, it was, I couldn't imagine studying trust without sort of putting front and forward this notion that your impact, regardless of how you think it is, how other people judge your impact matters. Uh, and that it's not just intended impact, it's also unintended impacts. Uh, and that I think is a very practical way of thinking about the fact that there are lots of things that go wrong in businesses that we don't want to have happen. Right, that's just the nature of being transaction-based business and trying to make things happen within certain guardrails. Uh, and so I wanted to, and I found the more companies that I studied is that the ones that are really good at that pay great attention to unintended impacts. Right, that's it. So they look at second and third order effects to try to understand if it's supply chain, how far down into the supply chain do they look, right? Uh, just in practical terms. Uh, and so, so you know, so it, it did actually come together from different sources. Uh, so it's not like I took someone else's model and sort of said, this is it. It's more, I had to kind of bootstrap it uh, from things I'd thought about for a long time. And I will shamelessly show my biases here by saying that I think, yes, of course, you need the rigor of, 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 of 
the research that's gone before and doing the literature reviews and so on, but there is also a very important extra element in the recipe, which is that 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 practice and thinking from a practical experiential perspective. So I think uh, hopefully Sally feels that she's got a good answer um, to how the the four big kind of building blocks of of, of, of trust that, that that Sandra is talking about um, uh, emerged. Now. Um, Annabelle, um, Annabelle Gillard, who's one of our International Advisory Council members and who was herself leading a webinar for the IBE um, very recently on some excellent research that uh, she's done for us um, on where does ethics fit into mm -hmm. ESG, the environmental and the social and the governance uh, aspects of, of, of the business. Annabelle's been posing a number of questions, but I want to start with, with one. Um, that she's raised about um, the impacts of artificial intelligence mm. on, on, on trust in, in organizations and so on. And so she asks, is there any variation in how these lessons that you've been sharing with us this afternoon, Sandra, apply given the increasing use of artificial intelligence in business processes? And she gives the examples from autonomous driving to um, the use of um, logarithms for um, deciding on insurance payouts or indeed hiring and you know, many people their job applications may never be read by a human being um, so what do we um, what, what what if anything um, changes in in this world where AI is going to be an increasing part of, of businesses yeah, so that, that's a really great uh, topic uh, to raise. Uh, and so I, and I have thought some about this and, I, and I've, I've looked at uh, some examples where this shows up. So I'll just give a couple of uh, things to think about. The first is that these algorithms are created by people. Uh, and we know that the algorithms actually have disparate effects uh, on different populations. Uh, and so if you look at facial recognition as an example, uh, there's a lot of research about the fact that it has a harder time recognizing black and brown faces than it does recognizing white faces. Uh, and so, so there's a kind of a who's governing the creation process, who is looking for the ethical issues uh, that are involved in whatever application of AI is being done. Uh, and, you know, there are many really wonderful and capable people kind of on this hunt. It's not a particular path of mine, but I, I think this notion of sort of making sure that you understand how the algorithm works and whether it actually is having effects that mean that the data that's being worked with is actually in some way distorted. Uh, and so that's sort of the first uh, thing. And I think the big theme I will have here is that AI, like any other business function needs to be managed. Yes. It needs to be governed and it needs to be thought of through an ethics lens uh, in order to try to mitigate unintended consequences. Uh, there's a very good example that came out uh, in aut autonomous driving uh, around, if you look at different approaches that different companies have taken to this, uh, if you compare uh, something like a Tesla to what GM has done, for example, you will find that companies have different standards for what actually constitutes a problem. They have different triggers for what it is that they start to worry about. And they have different ways of trying to test the robustness of these new technologies that they're creating. So you know, there's always been in, in innovation a, a principle called the precautionary principle. Uh, this is part of the ethics of innovation. Uh, and basically it speaks to the fact that whenever you're gonna deal with uh, a development that has unintended and unknowable effects, that your first stance should be a cautious one, right? Uh, and so, and, and you can imagine there are very different attitudes that you can have toward these technologies, you know, full steam ahead, let's just see what happens, pick up the pieces later, uh, or a more careful, deliberate kind of governed process. Uh, that really looks out for these things. And so, as you can tell from what I'm saying, I'm a huge believer that this doesn't absolve management of responsibility to make things happen in a good way, right? Uh -huh. This is a new application 
Ab ab absolutely. And, and there are some first principles that we can build up from, as you say, like, like the precautionary principle and, and, and so on. And, and there clearly are some important organizations here in the UK. We have the Ada Lovelace Institute, which is thinking about the, the ethics of artificial intelligence in the US. You have the Artificial Intelligence Partnership with all of the big tech companies based out in San Francisco and so on. I think this is something that we in the Institute need to give a lot more uh, attention to. So if we have anybody either on today's webinar or going to be watching afterwards who would like to kick us off with um, a guest blog um, for our website, um, we would love to hear from you on this, of course, or any other uh, topic. But the ethics of artificial intelligence is going to be um, obviously something for us to, to focus on. Now, I'd like to turn, um, because you you use the example of, of vaccinations and the, um, the, 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 the recent COVID uh, crisis, we're indeed uh, still in parts of the world ongoing COVID crisis. But uh, Anita asks um, a question about the pandemic. And she asks whether you believe, Sandra, that we have seen a widespread mind shift in leaders recognizing the importance of their organizations taking their social responsibilities seriously. And will it last post the mm -hmm. pandemic? Uh, so um, I'll, I'll give you, uh, so, so there's data on this, right? Uh, and so one of the sources, I, I'm a member of the Edelman Trust Institute. Uh, and so I, I, you know, like the, the rest of the world sort of watch their trust barometer and various trust. Uh, and so their recent study, most recent one that was uh, published in, uh, in actually late May, uh, it, it showed a couple of things uh, that would suggest that, uh, that what people have seen in the pandemic is an ongoing shift uh, in support for the broader footprint of corporate responsibility. So that's, so that's kind of the headline. Uh, and so the numbers look something like this. So uh, this was a study of 14,000 people across 14 countries globally. Uh, so it was by no means just the United States. Uh, what they found was that six out of 10 people thought post the invasion of Ukraine, uh, the companies have an obligation actually to be involved geopolitically three quarters of the respondents agree that the social responsibility aspect of business is now an entrenched responsibility and they trust businesses whether or not they are actually doing that, living up to that. And 85% of them agreed with the notion that businesses have traditional responsibilities, which include the health and welfare of their employees. So, so I, I think it's just important to contextualize this. This is not a new issue for business. What changed in the pandemic is that it used to be that unless you were in extractive mining uh, or in some heavy manufacturing, you didn't have to think too carefully about whether or not your employees were safe and well, right? You know, all of a sudden the pandemic, everyone's health is at risk. Uh, and so to me, that was actually the first time that I saw a common yardstick around health and wellness applied across literally every organization on the planet. Uh, and I do think that that will continue to privilege these issues about health and welfare uh, in a way that I think would have been very difficult now to kind of step back from. It's very hard to say we cared about you during the pandemic uh, and we will face an immediate test of this uh, in the United States as we await a decision about uh, abortion rights. Uh, in our country from our Supreme Court. Uh, and that's a reproductive rights question about reproductive health. Uh, and that will be a trust crisis, uh, depending on how that goes out, is right now expected to go against it, taking away this constitutionally guaranteed right uh, to have an abortion as a woman. Uh, and the reason I'm mentioning this is that this is an example of the way that these pandemic focus on health can actually start to move its way into other aspects. And so what I am anticipating is that businesses are gonna be called to account, not politically, which side they come out on, but are they gonna defend the individual employee's right to make decisions about their own health 
And so that's the way that I think that that's going to kind of keep growing. But and I'm sorry for the long and kind of data <laughs> ridden uh, answer. But but I so this is so firmly, I think, uh, now understood to be re accepted responsibilities of businesses to be trusted. Right, that I, I think we can count on that sort of staying, but it will continue to be challenged by new challenges. Again, I'm going to violently agree with you um, on, 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 on that point as well. And I think the, the supplement Edelman Trust Barometer that came out in May for, for this year's Davos meeting um, is fascinating because it does reinforce what they'd been showing in the previous couple of years about the importance of, of businesses being expected to speak out and speak up on on some of these issues and um if anyone is 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 interested watching um uh, our conversation sandra did uh, a fascinating talk which is on youtube for mckinsey and co uh, about uh, the book and one of the questions that you deal with there is when is it right for businesses um to speak out and and speak up when would it be expected to maintain trust in, in, in the organization's good faith and its, its sincerity and its commitment on, on certain issues? And when, by speaking out, might it in fact undermine um, people's trust in, in the organization and so on? And I suspect this is going to be particularly mm -hmm. difficult territory for business leaders in the United States to navigate in the next few years as we have this intensification of the culture wars and how do business leaders navigate through some of these incredibly toxic from a an outsider's perspective um debates where you have former vice president mike pence for example saying that business shouldn't be um, for, concerning itself with ESG and so on, and it should just be getting on with doing business, I think was, was, was his quote and so on. And indeed, quite a number of, of other Republican politicians criticizing business leaders for speaking out on, on, on some of these questions. So this is going to be a, um, a really difficult issue and, and, and perspective to, to navigate. Um, I just wanted to to pick up, we've got lots more questions. We're not going to be able to deal with, with all of them. Um, but we, there's a question um, in from um, Suleiman about um, how you, um, if you're in an organization um, which is, is losing trust, but which hasn't completely lost it yet, how, how would you in those circumstances apply your analysis. So, um, so that's a, a great example of the fact that the businesses are always kind of winning or losing, right? So, so this is not static, right? Uh, and, and so, uh, and what the question, which I like a lot, shows is a real understanding that you know that this is not like an on-off switch, you know, where I'm trusted or I'm not trusted. Uh, it's like these areas have come up and this has been a problem for us. Uh, and I would say that the good news, uh, to the extent that you think about it this way, uh, is that if you know that things are heading south, but they haven't yet landed there, you have points of intervention. Uh, so, you know, the framework that I applied uh, is a parsing framework to start to ask, well, where is it that we're losing trust and with whom? Uh, and to get much more analytical uh, about where it is that you think the problem is and what the problem's about. Is this, you know, the fact that they think we're just not good at the things we are sp supposed to be good at? You know, are they questioning our motives, whose interests we care about? Are they questioning how we go about doing what we're doing? Are they questioning our impact? Uh, so there are probably additional questions that any business could ask to that. But uh, you know, so I think the big lesson here is to start inquiring about where you are and find an analytical approach that allows you to get below the I think things are not going well level. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm quite indifferent as to which approach you use. I do know that, uh, that it's much easier to start to nip this thing in the bud than to actually go through the full we've lost trust and now we actually have a breach that we need to recover from. Uh, so if you can sort of get in front of the train 
uh, and see that you know that you could stop it at that point and start to understand why it's heading off in a new direction. That's a very good problem to have on a relative basis. So not being complacent and keeping inquisitive right. and and constantly looking to see where um, might there be some early signals, some early warnings that not all is well in terms of of of, of, of trust. Another question we had early on from Annabelle was about whether this is about real trust or is it simply the perception of trustworthiness um, that, that, you've, you, that you've been um, looking at? So the, the actual question was, have your studies broken down how much the effect is due to the perception of trustworthiness or underlying trustworthiness or how much of the trust benefit is due to the perception versus the reality. And I suspect this may be about um, time frame, time horizons. Yeah. Uh, so I, I would say, Annabelle, that the answer is that um, I care, my research is much more grounded in the perception of trustworthiness, right? Uh, and so, so to me, that's actually the domain in which companies can do something about. Right. So that's why I think it's it's a good handle on uh, as to whether real trust exists, how you think about that. That's a very worthwhile inquiry. Just thinking as a business person, what I cared about is which stakeholders think I'm trustworthy and why and how that does. So that's a perception issue. And that's why one of the most important general kind of principles that I showed was trust is in the eye of the beholder. Right, so this is very much an eye of the beholder approach to trust that accepts the fact that people trust for very different reasons and that that's the nature of the complexity that you have to deal with if you're trying to manage trust as a business, uh, trying to go after it. I think that as a researcher, you could definitely ask really interesting and important questions about trust itself and the degree to which it exists. Uh, but this is a different kind of a hunt. Thank, thank you very much. Now, if you're going to give one piece of advice to everyone watching on 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 the the webinar um sandra about how to to get started on taking a more proactive approach to 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 your organization and how it's trusted what what would you what would you say as as, as some of the things practical that people might do tomorrow yeah so so uh, the the way I would start uh, is in decisions that need to be made. So I'd say, okay, we have to make an important decision about X. Uh, and the question I would ask about that decision, uh, is this decision going to cause us to gain trust or to lose trust and with whom? So I would start to use trust as a lens through which to strategize around business decision making. Uh, and you do in this active sense of kind of not as much sort of dealing with what it is or even how it's been in the past, but more forward looking to try to anticipate the trust effects uh, that a given decision would have. And I think that's the lever that most of us have as business people is that we're always allocation resources, problems that we decide to put to the top of the list versus the bottom of the list. Uh, but the, the question is we have a decision to make uh, and will this decision allow us to gain trust or to lose trust and with whom? I think that is 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 an excellent place to to draw this particular conversation to um, to a um, a close for today. Sandra, thank you enormously for for sparing the time to talk about your super book, The Power of Trust, How Companies Build It, Lose It, Regain It. And whilst, of course, it's about companies, I suspect that this is also true for charities and social enterprises and public agencies, governments and so on um, as well. Um, Sandra, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Can I thank everyone for joining us. Um, the recording will be on our website and on, on YouTube um, tomorrow um, or certainly after the weekend. And um, you can follow more of, of, of Sandra's work um, if you Google on, on YouTube. There are several other really good uh, conversations with her. But for now, Sandra, thank you very much indeed. And just a reminder that our next um, IB event is that masterclass about speaking up 
and how you create a speak up culture, which is really positive, which is on Tuesday, the 19th of July. But for now, thank you so much. And for anyone on the webinar, if you want to spare just a moment to fill in um, your evaluation form afterwards, they are read. Um, we do use them to help to continuously improve. But Sandra, thank you. Thank you all so much. Thanks Bye. for your great questions. Okay, thank you. Bye.